2050. She'll do this by advancing cutting edge clean energy technologies, creating millions of good paying union clean energy jobs, and building an equitable clean energy future. Secretary Granholm was the first woman elected governor of Michigan, serving two terms from 2003 to 2011. As governor, she successfully led efforts to diversify the state's economy, strengthen its auto industry, preserve the manufacturing sector, and add emerging sectors, such as clean energy, to Michigan's economic portfolio. Today, one-third of all North American electric vehicle battery production takes place in Michigan. The state is one of the top five states for clean energy patents, and 126,000 Michiganders were employed in the clean energy sector prior to COVID-19. She also was the first woman elected Attorney General of Michigan and served as the state's top law enforcement officer from 1998 to 2002. As always, she can take a few questions. I'll be the bad cop, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, great. I get to bring my binder to the double binder stack here. Um, thank you so much, Jen. I really am privileged to be able to share the podium uh, with you today. And um, good afternoon, everybody. So, you know, I think that um, President uh, Biden asked me to be the Secretary of Energy because um, I was the governor during a time when the auto industry was on its knees and when auto workers were finding themselves out of work through no fault of their own. I feel like I have looked into the eyes of people who have been um, desperate and at a loss more times than I can count. And I was also governor when we invested to diversify Michigan's economy to build car 2.0, which is the electric vehicle and the guts to that vehicle, the battery. And now here we are 12 years later and General Motors is saying that their entire fleet is going to be electrified. It is uh, a huge distance that we've traveled. And so much of that is thanks to the decision by the federal government to invest in saving the backbone of the manufacturing industry, which was at that point the electric, uh, or the vehicle industry. The Obama-Biden uh, efforts really made a statement and worked. And so, we can do so much uh, more than what we did in Michigan, and this is what the American Jobs Plan is all about. I'm so, I feel so um, happy for America that we have a president who wants to invest in our country and in our workers and in our manufacturing. And so, to me, the fact that there is out there globally a $23 trillion market for clean energy products, for products that will reduce gre greenhouse gas emissions, is a massive opportunity for this country. And you better believe that other countries are seeing that opportunity as well. And our economic competitors are working to corner the market on those opportunities. Countries like China are pressing their foot on the pedal and revving up their electric engines, and they are thrilled to see that the United States is standing still while they are working to create jobs for their people. Um, when I, after I was finished being governor, I traveled to China to see their, um, their clean energy um, efforts. I was with a group, and we went to um, a city, and I was standing next to the mayor of the city in China, and during a demonstration, he leaned over to me and he said, so, when do you think the United States is going to get a clean energy plan? And at this point, and this was several years ago, I said, oh, I don't know, there's so much uh, polarization, it's difficult in Congress to get consensus. And he just looked at me and he smiled and he said, take your time, take your time. Because they saw our passivity as their opportunity and it's not just in China, it's in other countries too. Understandably, countries want to corner this market on clean energy products because we have 195 countries who have committed to lowering their greenhouse gas emissions. So the question is, where are those products going to be built and who are they gonna be built by? And it's gonna take a lot of work, literally. We need millions of people in the United States working to lower greenhouse gas emissions and we all know that in the 21st century, making sure that we have the right infrastructure is critical. Infrastructure 
is, yes, roads and bridges, but it is ports and airports, and it is trains, and it is the pipes that pump water into our homes, and it is the broadband that brings the world and learning to our children. It's the broadband that brings uh, economic opportunity to our businesses. Of course, it's the electrical grid that keeps the lights on after what happened in Texas. Can anybody really doubt that electricity and the electric grid is part of the foundation of who we are as a nation, and we need to invest in it if we want to make sure power keeps coming to our homes. There was an interesting um, poll that was done in February by Consumers Reports, and they found that 76% of Americans think that broadband is as important as electricity and water. water. I mean, how can we not agree that broadband is infrastructure? And yet, we have been disinvesting in infrastructure as a, as a nation for decades, in infrastructure, in research and development, and in manufacturing, all of them we have been disinvesting in. Infrastructure, as you know, is now the smallest share of our economy since World War II. We are at a 72-year low with respect to manufacturing. Research and development has been dropping since the 1960s. China and our economic com competitors are investing in research and development because they want to seize the future. They want to surpass the United States. And if we allow that to happen, we will be weaker as a nation and we will fall. And we cannot do that. And that's what this American Jobs Plan is all about. So we can't just sit around saying we need to do this. It's bipartisan. We know that Republicans and Democrats, it's a joke in Washington, Infrastructure Week. And Democrats and Republicans have been making that joke. But it's not a joke anymore. We need to get it done. And there is bipartisan support for these elements, these basic elements. So starting on uh, Inauguration Day, just to say a word about what DOE, Department of Energy, has been doing. We've been rolling out efforts uh, to research and development and deploy clean energy technologies um, with an eye toward creating jobs. Uh, and if the American Jobs Plan passes, this will be able to be put on steroids. So in the past two weeks, just as an example, we made two announcements um, on research, one, or one on research and one on deployment of offshore wind. The research one was to cut the cost of solar by half yet again in the next 10 years. And on offshore wind, it was to add 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy on the Atlantic uh, seaboard, again, within 10 years. Today, we are announcing another two, two uh, funding opportunities for clean energy technology. One of them is to create next generation biofuels for airplanes and ships, which are very hard to electrify. And the second is to announce clean energy technology funding opportunity to reduce methane emissions from the coal, oil, and gas industry. And as uh, many of you know, methane is an extremely potent and dangerous greenhouse gas. But these investments are really just a down payment on what we need to do as a nation, and the American Jobs Project will take us the rest of the way. And I um, want to emphasize, the, the because I've been meeting with so many stakeholders on this, the, the true importance of ensuring that 40 percent of the benefits of the American Jobs Plan go to communities that have been left behind or unseen, people who have um, been in the shadows of power plants and whose children have to gasp to breathe or use an inhaler. We need to remedy a moral wrong and make those investments, and the American Jobs Plan will allow us to do that. It's a once-in-a-century investment to seize a once-in-a-century opportunity. That's what the people elected Joe Biden to do, and we've waited far too long to do it. So we're going to get it done, and we're going to put America to work, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Secretary. Um, if I can shift gears a little bit, one of the things in the President's in, uh, infrastructure package was investments in nuclear, advanced nuclear development. Uh, one of the things I know you mentioned, you re reiterated during your confirmation hearings, the President's opposition to funding for a nuclear fuel repository up the mountain. 
where does the Biden administration plan to store the nation's spent uh, radioactive nuclear fuel and what's the ongoing process of that review? Yeah, you, uh, some of you may recall there was a bipartisan commission on what to do about spent nuclear fuel. There has to be a consent-based process to be able to do that. We are beginning that work inside of the Department of Energy. We have to find a solution, but it has to be based on, you know, community agreement. Is there a timetable for that review when you? We'll, we'll make an announce. We'll be making an announcement on that. Not ready to say yet. And, and then just uh, start just changing gears again. Uh, uh, the, uh, the last administration invested heavily in the nation's nuclear triad. The, the, the development of new and improved uh, nuclear, nu nuclear weaponry. Is, that, is the policy of this administration that, that a lot of this development falls under your department to continue that, that R&D, that expensive R&D to modernize the nation's nuclear arsenal? We have to modernize the nation's nuclear arsenal. We have to keep and maintain the stockpile to make sure that it is safe and effective, and we will continue to do that to ensure that we can um, deter nuclear aggression from other countries. So our nuclear deterrent is important and it is embedded in the values of that stockpile and we'll make sure that our people are safe. Thank you so much. After you talk about the corporate tax rate and what they want to do with this infrastructure bill, can this infrastructure bill be successful with a 25% corporate tax rate? You know, as the president has said, this is a negotiation and he really does want to hear from Democrats and Republicans about what would be acceptable to get this across the line. Um, so there is room for negotiation. The, his point is that it has to be paid for. And so if it's not a 28 percent, what, what else is it? And we're very um, encouraged by, by those who have been bringing ideas forth. And we are hopeful that, especially when Congress gets back uh, next week, that those discussions can begin in earnest. All right. Thank you. Um, you're one of the five cabinet secretaries that the president is tasked with engaging with Congress on this. You mentioned the president's willing to negotiate. He says he's open to alternative ways to pay for this if Republicans put forth any. In your conversations at all, have you heard any such alternatives from Republican members? Um, I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to make announcements for them. They obviously want to bring forth their own ideas, but I have heard alternatives, yes. And the president also asked you to, to help uh, engage the public in selling this plan. Um, you haven't hit the road yet, though. Is that something that you plan to do in the coming weeks? Well, we're going to be um, taking our guidance uh, you know, from the White House in terms of what's safe, et cetera. We've certainly been hitting the Zoom uh, and, uh, and making our case through that and the phones. So we'll see you know, how it goes. There is a, a period of time that um, we have to be able to do this, but we want to make sure that it's safe. Emma? Yeah. Um, in terms of the negotiations, the discussions with Congress, is there a deadline? Is there a time frame that where this turns into a pumpkin, or you just go it alone? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if you want to answer that, Jen. Uh, we'll have a whole briefing after this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know that they said that they would like to see progress by Memorial Day, um, and hopefully we can start to see that. But obviously, those meetings have to begin uh, in earnest next week. Francesca, thank you. What do you say to Americans working in the oil and gas industry in California and elsewhere who say that these have been good paying jobs that have given them access to the middle class? And what, if anything, can the federal government do to ensure that these clean energy jobs like the ones that you described are as good as the ones that they'll be replacing? Yeah, this is a great question. And we this is why the American Jobs Plan is very um, specifically targeting communities in coal and power plant areas in gas and, uh, and natural gas. There are billions of dollars in this bill for the technologies that will reduce CO2 emissions in, in, those, in those industries. For example, carbon capture, use and sequestration. I don't mean to get too technical, but uh, hydrogen deployment and demonstration projects. I've been talking with my counterparts around the world. There is a huge appetite for a partnership with America on these next generation technologies that will reduce CO2 emissions from that kind of baseline power. Those jobs in those kind of technologies are good paying jobs. Those are jobs that are going to be for welders and sheet metal workers and all of the trades. And we're going to, as we put out funding opportunities, ensure that there are project labor agreements, that the people who are working in them are paid 
uh, under Davis-Bacon or paid prevailing wage. So we want to create good paying jobs all across the country, and there will be millions of them if this is passed. The opportunities, this is why we've been having a huge um, number of discussions with our uh, brothers and sisters in the labor movement, in the building trades, to make sure that we do this in a way that gives their workers opportunity, and it will, and that's why they're supportive of it. Steve? You, you mentioned the next generation biofuels for airplanes and ships. When, when you would ex expect something like that to come online? I mean, we'll see planes flying with biofuels. Yeah, well, it's going to take, I mean, obviously we got to get started on it, and this is a research uh, opportunity. It is not a deployment opportunity. But there, because uh, funding opportunities really accelerate so much uh, appetite for the technology, and because there have been a lot of breakthroughs, in fact, the airline industry itself has been investing in next generation biofuels uh, to be able to demonstrate that it can be used. So, uh, you know, without saying specifically, I think in certainly within five to ten years, we will be able to see this uh, deployed and available for both shipping and for air. Last question to Nancy. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering how, you, you're talking about how the, the American um, Jobs Plan, if it passed, would create good jobs. I'm wondering what levers that the federal government has uh, to ensure that those jobs will be, you know, at a certain wage scale, have benefits, like, what can you do to enforce that? Yeah, I mean, as, as we know, the, the federal government has many mechanisms for pushing out funding, and that includes bidding on projects, and that includes passing, uh, passing it through for in competitions, et cetera. In those opportunities, you can put, you know, attach strings to make sure that these are good paying jobs, that they have project labor agreements, et cetera. And so I know it is, and it's true with respect to the federal government's buying power as well, its procurement uh, power. We want to make sure that we create good paying jobs for all kinds of people in every pocket of America, and that means good paying union jobs. So we're going to use every every lever possible to be able to do that, including if you want to bid on this, you've got to make sure that you have a project labor, labor agreement. Thank you, Secretary Granholm. All right. Thank us. you. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you. See you. Thank you so much. Wait, I got to grab my, oh, go, my go mask. Ahead. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Couple items at the top. Um, as President Biden noted in a proclamation issued on Sunday, we are marking Holocaust Remembrance Day this week. Today we rededicate ourselves to standing in solidarity with the Jewish people in America, Israel, and around the world, and to remembering the horrors of the Holocaust. An estimated six million Jews perished along, alongside millions of other innocent victims uh, around, around the world. Uh, we honor the memories of precious lives lost, reflect on the incomprehensible wounds to our humanity and the lessons learned, and mourn for the communities broken and scattered. And we embrace Holocaust survivors, some of whom are still with us. They deserve our continued support to live in dignity. Uh, with that, short, short top, I only had one today. Go ahead. Thank and you. a secretary. Um, so on, on the president's uh, gun announcement, he, he uh, announced that he's going to ask Congress to uh, take action to uh, repeal gun, uh, gun manufacturers' liability protections. Yes. Uh, that had been a day one promise of his. When should we expect to see that text uh, sent to the Hill? And, you know, if it was a priority, if it is as big a priority as he said it was for him just a few minutes ago, you know, why, why, how much effort is the president willing to put into gun control right now when so much of the administration's focus right now is on, on the infrastructure plan? Well, first let me say that there has been legislation uh, introduced in past uh, Congresses, and we certainly hope, and he's calling for, uh, members to reintroduce legislation on uh, li gun liabilities for manufacturers. It is an issue that he talked about on the campaign trail, and he continues to believe that addressing that, holding manufacturers to the same account as other industries, is pivotal in keeping our community safe, keeping our families safe, and addressing the threat of gun violence across the country. Uh, so what he he is calling for is for the introduction of legislation, of which there has been past versions. Uh, I will say that this has been an issue that the President has been working on for decades throughout his career. He helped pass the Brady Bill. He helped uh, get a uh, get, uh, ban assault weapons uh, back in the 90s. He believes that 
taking additional steps on background checks, that putting in place an assault weapons ban again are pivotal to keeping our country safe. He strongly supports the background check bills, the two that have passed the House. It is imperative for any president to walk and chew gum at the same time, to continue to push for, to advocate for, to use uh, the bully pulpit of the Rose Garden to push forward uh, a range of agenda items, and he certainly will continue to do that on putting in place common sense gun safety measures. A couple of weeks ago, in a, in a press conference, the president sort of said, you know, sequencing is important here, but essentially acknowledging that maybe, you know, if the president can walk into gun, maybe Congress can't, and the president decided to put infrastructure uh, uh, before gun control, before, uh, before climate change, before some of, the, some of these, uh, these other issues. Why is why are guns not going before infrastructure? Well, Congress ha plays the role, the Senate and the House, in moving legislation forward. And at any given time, there are multiple pieces of legislation moving their way through committees, moving their way through the House, moving their way to the Senate. There are two background check bills that have passed the House that can move to the Senate. He certainly is an advocate for those, while at the same time being an advocate for moving forward on the American Jobs Plan. And then uh, finally, just a different topic on, on Afghanistan. Uh, should we expect to hear from the president before May 1 about what he will do with American troops still there? I mean, it seems they're, they're going to stay there beyond, beyond the sort of times running out to foot for an ordered withdrawal from, from troops still there. Right now, is that an accurate assessment that there will be troops there on, 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 sorry, on May 2nd? Um, and then in terms of what is the president's message to the American people? Why is it in their interest for their troops to be serving in harm's way overseas beyond? Well, I'm not going to get ahead of the President's uh, decision and announcement. I expect you will hear from him before May 1st. He has been consistent and clear that it is operationally challenging to get troops out by May 1, which is not a deadline he put in place. Uh, it is a timeline put in place by the prior administration. Uh, and there are certainly conditions on the ground, including efforts on uh, diplomacy, efforts to uh, negotiate with the Taliban that have been underway for the last several weeks. But he will, you will certainly hear from him. Uh, and once you do, we can absolutely have a conversation about where we go from here. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, given the narrow majorities in the House and the Senate right now, does the president think enacting universal background checks this year is doable? I think the president is going to leave the analysis of what's viable and doable to all of you and people on the outside. Uh, and certainly he's not vote counting himself, but he, has, he is also clear-eyed about the challenges in moving forward with legislation with the current makeup of the Senate. He is going to continue to advocate for that, as he did just today, just this morning, in the Rose Garden, surrounded by some of the bravest and most courageous uh, advocates for gun uh, control, gun safety legislation in the country. Uh, but he also is not going to wait. And he, that's why he took action on, uh, announced several steps that can be taken in the form of executive actions, in the form of guidance, uh, and in the form of nominating uh, someone to lead the ATF, because he feels you can't wait, and he's going to use the power of his presidency to take steps forward. Because this gets a little bit of what Zeke was getting at. I mean, we have a jobs cabinet now. We have face-to-face -face and Zoom meetings ongoing with Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. about infrastructure. Should we anticipate a gun control cabinet or meetings with Republicans about this issue? I, I certainly would anticipate the president will raise this issue uh, in a range of conversations he has with members of Congress. There are, this obviously is slightly different given the role of the Attorney General in uh, measures on gun safety, and at, as is evidenced by the fact that he was present there today. So it's a bit different from a jobs cabinet, but I can assure you for members where this is appropriate, where it's an appropriate role for them to play, for members of the administration in the White House and otherwise to communicate with members of Congress, that will certainly continue to be at the top of our list. Two other unrelated things real quick. Uh, the U.S. and Iran are engaged and indirect nuclear talks this week. Mm -hmm. Will Americans detained in Iran be part of those discussions? Uh, certainly, Americans detained in Iran is an issue that we have raised with partners around the world and those who are having direct discussions uh, with the Iranians. In terms of the focus and content of these discussions, I know they'll do a readout when they conclude the meetings, uh, likely tomorrow. And beyond what Secretary Blinken, I know he held a meeting with families or representatives of them early on. Is, mm -hmm. can, Give us a sense of what else may be ongoing in this regard. 
in, in the effort to get uh, Americans, Americans who are detained, uh, you know, the uh, efforts would certainly be led by our diplomats uh, and our negotiators out of the State Department, hence your reference to Secretary of State Tony Blinken. And obviously these discussions are often raised through different channels we have with the Iranians, given the fact that we're not currently having direct talks on, on even uh, issues like the nuclear negotiations. Uh, but I'm not going to have an update beyond that from here. Tomorrow, the Army Corps of Engineers will be at a federal court hearing regarding the fate of the Dakota Access Pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the administration's belief that the construction of that pipeline should continue? Uh, our view is that we would look at each pipeline uh, through each individual pipeline separately and do an analysis of the costs and benefits on the environment and uh, jobs, uh, which is my assumption would be happening here. So I don't have an assessment of that, but we look at each of them individually. Conceivably, we get that tomorrow at the court hearing. Uh, I, I, I'm the delay, I guess, in considering this, given that the administration asked for more time. So we're trying to figure out if we may get that tomorrow. I, it wouldn't come from the White House, presumably, but I can certainly check if there's a, an ex expected timeline that we can share from here. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, following up on Zeke's question on the manufacturer liability bill, mm -hmm. the president just said that if God granted him one item on his to-do list, it would be to get this done, to make it so that gun manufacturers can be held liable. It is something he promised on day one. It is day 78. What's the holdup here? There's no holdup. It just legislation needs to be reintroduced. Uh, there are a number of members uh, in Congress who are strong advocates for exactly what the president supports, uh, share his view about the impact, and uh, we're certainly hopeful and encourage them to move forward on that legislation, reintroduce it. But the president plan promised to send his own plan. You know, it's clear that you're waiting to see how this works its way through Congress, but why not put out your own bill, lead the charge on this? He, he is leading the charge by advocating for this moving forward, by using the bully pulpit of his presidency and of the Rose Garden to advocate for this legislation moving forward. It is the role of Congress, of course, to push legislation forward, to vote on it, to move it through committees, and he certainly is hopeful they'll do exactly that on this issue. The president did suggest recently that, you know, tackling this is a long-term issue, as he put it. Given the recent shootings, does he still see it that way? Does he still see this as a long-term issue? I think he certainly sees it as an issue that we won't solve overnight. So, yes, um, he sees and is encouraged by uh, the actions that we've seen uh, across states. Take red flag laws as an example. There are 19 states. Many have, have implemented those laws in just the last few years. We know that they're impactful. In many places, there's bipartisan support for that. What he, one of the announcements he made today was uh, that we will be putting forward guidance to make it easier for states to put forward those laws. He knows that sometimes the first action doesn't happen at the federal level. It can happen at the state level. We've certainly seen that on a range of issues, and we've seen that on uh, gun safety legislation as well. Uh, so he's, he's encouraged by that, but knows that it can be a long journey. And has he been in touch with, with Leader Schumer about the next steps forward, especially on, on these bills that have passed the House? He, as you know, he's regularly in touch with Leader Schumer, who shares his uh, commitment and concerns about the impact of gun violence on our communities, on, on this country, uh, and uh, they certainly discuss this among a range of other issues. The President does actually have it here, the list of all the promises that he made uh, during the campaign of gun actions that he wanted to take. Obviously, you're doing what, what you think you can uh, unilaterally, mm -hmm. waiting for these measures to work its way through Congress. Does the President feel that he's doing everything he can to meet the scope of these commitments right now? Well, today the administration announced initial actions to address gun violence. Uh, there will be more. That is absolutely his commitment. And he also uh, will use the power of his presidency, his voice, uh, his political will uh, to uh, advocate for uh, actions in Congress. He also recognizes that there are incredible roles to be played by many of the gun safety groups and leaders that were here today who have helped pass laws in states across the country on everything from background checks to red flag laws, uh, uh, efforts that have had a, a measurable impact in states to reduce incidents of gun violence, of homicide, of suicide as a result of guns. So he will remain engaged with those groups and those leaders as well, and he will work on this uh, on, through many levers. Go ahead, Caitlin. With these ghost guns, they can basically be bought, printed, and assembled at home. So how is the president confident that this rule can be enforced? Well, it's a rule that is being put in place by the Department of Justice. Uh, it is certainly a step to make that more difficult to regulate 
uh, an area of gun production that has not pri been regulated previously. So it's something that will have to be worked through through law enforcement officials around the country through the Department of Justice. Right, but if you're like doing it at your house, how are they going to know to be able to enforce that? Well, there's the purchase of kits, of course, that's part of it. Um, but certainly putting in place steps to make it more difficult, to make it harder, to regulate uh, the ability to gain access to uh, ghost guns, ghost gun kits is certainly a step forward in our view. Okay. Uh, my other question is on the ATF nominee. When, he, when is he expected to formally nominate David Chipman to this role? Uh, I mean, put forward his uh, nomination to Congress. I would I would expect quite soon. I don't think there's any reason for a delay of that. I will say that um, David Chipman, who for others who are not as familiar with his background, because I know there's been a Twitter about him uh, out there, but uh, he has 25 years of experience at the ATF. He has helped uh, with the 1993 World Trade Center bomb. He helped invest. He helped while he was there. Uh, there was investigations into the World Trade Center bombing and Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, he's overseen complex firearms trafficking cases, and he is a gun owner himself. So the president's view is there's no one better to lead the ATF. He's certainly looking forward to putting his nomination forward, and I expect there would be no delay in that. Given his history as a gun control advocate, is the White House worried that this is going to be an uphill battle to get him confirmed? Well, it's up to Congress. He's also somebody who has, he has certainly been an advocate for gun safety measures, but he also has 25 years of experience at the ATF. He's been involved in uh, playing, he's played a pivotal role in investigations. He is a gun owner himself. So uh, he has a broad swath of qualifications, and certainly we believe he's somebody who should be seriously considered by Congress. So you're confident he can get confirmed? Well, that's up to the Senate. We, the president gets to pick who he wants to nominate. He's nominated somebody who is qualified, who has decades decades of experience, who is a gun owner himself, and it is up to the Senate to decide if they move forward with his nomination. My last question, sorry, is on the refugee cap that the President has proposed raising to 62500 but he's not actually formally signed the paperwork yet. Is the White House still committed to raising that cap to 62500 by this fiscal year? Yes. And so we should expect that before October? To change from 62,500 is my other question. I don't anticipate that it is uh, that it would change. I should say it is uh, remains the president remains committed to raising the cap. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I following on Caitlin. Have you um, have you counted the votes? Do you think that Chipman can be confirmed by Democrats alone? It seems as though there may be at least one Democrat who I can think of who has a decent grade with the NRA and may not support an ATF director. Um, are there any Republicans that you could win over, or is this going to be a nomination that languishes like so many other ATF directors have in the past? We're certainly familiar with the history. The president would not have nominated him if he didn't think he was qualified and didn't think he was someone that the Senate, members of both parties, should uh, give fair hearing to, seriously consider uh, confirming. But we just announced his nomination today, so I don't have an assessment of the legislative outlook quite yet. Okay. Um, quickly, when is the... Uh, address to a joint session of Congress. Have you figured out that or the logistics on that, what it'll look like? I can't wait till we can announce this. I, I, <laughs> I'm with you. We can all share a joy on that. We are still working through and finalizing the date, the logistics. The President remains committed to delivering a joint session. We're working with leaders in Congress to finalize that. We certainly hope we'll have more to say soon. Matter. General Matt Motors has halted production in North America at several factories um, and extended shutdowns because of this semiconductor chip shortage. Yeah. Um, it's disrupting the auto industry, and and I'm wondering, um, are there any short-term measures that the federal government can take to help with this shortage? Is there anything that can be done? Well, let me first say that. Um, we fully recognize that this is an issue that is impacting industries across the country, including the auto industry. Uh, earlier this year, um, the President held a meeting in his office with a bipartisan, bicameral uh, group. He continues to work. He feels there's opportunity to work with members of both parties on addressing uh, what is a very challenging issue for many industries. There's a, there's a 100 day review that is ongoing, uh, which we plan to share the outcome of with the American people soon. And we're certainly looking through that review at um, undertaking, the review is focused, I should say, on undertaking uh, the first ever whole of government approach to building a resilient, diverse, and secure supply chain uh, to help address this issue for the long term uh, so that we are not just dealing with a short term emergency. Um, the, uh, the President has also proposed 
uh, inc included, I should say, $50 billion to create an office at the Commerce Department dedicated to monitoring d domestic industrial capacity uh, because he recognizes that this is an issue that we will need to continue to address. And finally, next week there's going to be a meeting uh, led by our NAC director and our national security advisor with a number of uh, companies we should have more details on, hopefully by tomorrow for all of you, to help discuss, get some private sector input on how to address this issue. So this is something that there is a great deal of focus on at the highest level across government. Go ahead. Just following up what Tam said, um, and the president's meeting, the president's supposed to meet with the Japanese prime minister mm -hmm. next Friday, and I'm wondering if he'll ask Japan to place restrictions on exports of semiconductor chips to China. Well, he is meeting with the Japanese Prime Minister, to, as, as we've confirmed, uh, next Friday. Um, I certainly expect uh, semiconductors and the shortage to be a part of that discussion, but we're just not going to get ahead of the agenda of that. I expect they'll, they'll have remarks uh, and take questions following the meeting. And just one more thing, Jen. Um, the President has said that next week he intends to host lawmakers in the Oval Office mm -hmm. once they're back from recess. I wonder if you could give us any preview of whether, that, whether or not that will include Democrats, Republicans, what type of outreach that will look like. I, I expect he'll have both Democrats and Republicans attend uh, or join. And once we have confirmation of attendees, we'll share that information with all of you. Go ahead. The meeting next week on semiconductors, do you expect that to lead to some recommendations on what to do about this problem? I, I would say, Steve, that it's part of our effort. And again, it's led by the National Security Advisor and our, our Director of the National Economic Council. So it shows you what a priority this is to the President. Uh, to have a discussion about best practices, what they're, uh, how it's, uh, the shortage is impacting their industries, take that information back as part of our 100-day review. I, I wouldn't say I'm predicting an outcome or an announcement immediately coming out of it as much as it's part of our consulting processes we're working to address uh, a, an issue that's impacting a range of industries. Is there some complication to raising the refugee camp cap? We've been hearing about this for a couple of months now. Uh, no, I, we remain committed to it, um, and I know there's a question about signing, signing the paperwork, but it remains a commitment, and uh, when it's signed, we will update all of you on that as well. There's been an escalation of violence in Northern Ireland. Are you aware of this? You have yes. a response to this? Any, you we do. in touch with the parties? Uh, we do. Um, we are concerned by the violence in Northern Ireland, and we join the British, Irish, and Northern Irish leaders in their calls for calm. We remain steadfast supporters of a secure and prosperous Northern Ireland in which all communities have a voice and enjoy the gains of the hard-won peace. We welcome the provisions in both the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol, which help protect the gains of the, Bel the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. At this point, I would expect that um, engagements and discussions are at the level of the State Department, um, and I expect my colleague over there will see if he has an update on those engagements today in his briefing. Go ahead, Francesca. Thanks, Jen. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis announced a lawsuit today against the CDC and the federal government demanding that cruise liners be able to operate again, and Florida's Attorney General said the suit was filed this morning against those entities and HHS pushing to have the government's conditional sale order declared unlawful. Does the White House have a response to Florida's lawsuit? We don't have a direct response to a lawsuit nor a comment on a specific legal action, but I will just reiterate that the CDC guidance is based on uh, data and health and medical uh, guidelines, uh, hence uh, that's why they put it out and why they regularly update it. Well, the President has set forth July 4th as the date he'd like to see Americans who are vaccinated be able to gather in small groups. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the CDC said last week that there's a low risk for vaccinated Americans who travel. So does the president think it's an appropriate timeline of July 4th? That's what the cruise industry, specifically Norwegian uh, travel, is asking for is, is a July 4th date here. We would defer to the CDC uh, on any updated guidelines, uh, but I don't anticipate that, but I would defer to them on uh, any, um, uh, any, any expectation they have of changing those guidelines. Again, they base them on uh, health and medical uh, experts who work at the CDC. On base, they base them on data. The President's uh, announcement on July 4th has nothing to do with cruise lines, as you know. It has to do with uh, incentivizing, encouraging Americans to get access to the vaccine when they can get vaccinated. As we know, by the end of May, we will have enough vaccine supply to ensure every adult American can be vaccinated. So that's more about gatherings, small gatherings in your backyards, which is quite different from cruises, of course. Well, 
part of July 4th is because that's the date that Norwegian Cruise Line is asking for uh, them to be able to allow to uh, vaccinated individuals to be able to cruise. So that's where the July 4th date comes from. But also, more broadly speaking, they're asking in this industry for them to be able to be treated the same way that planes and airlines are able to be treated. So is there any specific concern that the White House has about allowing people who've been vaccinated to be able to resume cruising? Again, the, we rely on the guidance of the CDC, uh, health and medical experts. There's a return to science in this administration. They have guidelines they've put out on cruises, cruise lines. If they decide to update them, that is their prerogative to do, but that's not a decision made by the White House. Go ahead. Since uh, the last time you were asked about the state and local tax deduction. Jonathan Salant, by the way, I recognize you by your voice. I can't see your mustache. <laughs> He has a good mustache for anyone who doesn't know. Go ahead. Uh, last time you were asked about state level tax deduction. Yep. Since then, uh, Speaker Pelosi has now come out in favor of removing the cap. You know, we know where Schumer stands on the cap. And we also know that the uh, House Democrats, enough House Democrats, mostly from New York and New Jersey, have said they won't support bills without removing the cap. Uh, given the, and they could sink the bill if they stand for that thing. Given that, uh, are you working with members of Congress now to try to find a way to address their concerns and deduction cap? Well, we, we certainly know this is a proposal that a number of members have, and they've advocated for eliminating the SALT uh, deduction or returning the SALT deduction, I guess I should say. Uh, it is not a revenue raiser, as you well know, uh, and but we are open to hearing their ideas, uh, whether it's this or whether it is different proposals or different numbers for the corporate tax rate, what it could be raised to, or whether it is different ways we can approach expanding broadband access or rebuilding our roads, railways, bridges, and helping our caregivers. So we expect this to be a part of the discussion. We expect members to continue to bring forward ideas, uh, including around issues like SALT, and that will be a part of the negotiations moving forward. The other question is, before President Biden took office, he got a letter from advocates, uh, uh, safety advocates who lost loved ones in truck crashes. Mm -hmm. Truck crashes are up about 35 percent over the last 10 years. They asked them to support certain provisions, technology to reduce crashes. Those, those uh, technologies, including automatic braking systems, mm -hmm. speed delimiters, were recommended on Tuesday by the National Transportation Safety Board. Mm -hmm. Is that something the President supports? Or going to have people in the agencies look at trying to impose some of those new safety restrictions. I certainly have to talk to him about it, but the good news is our Secretary of Transportation is coming tomorrow to the briefing room, so it sounds like a good question somebody can ask him as well. But we'll see if we can get something more for you before then as well. And one other thing, I know under the Obama-Biden administration, they began a rulemaking to address sleep apnea, which was implicated in several fatal crashes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was dropped in 2017. Is that something, again, you guys are looking at resurrecting that rule? I, I, re I remember that rule well. Um, I would have to check with our team who works on rulemaking as it relates to uh, transportation. Uh, and again, these all sound like good questions for our Secretary of Transportation, but we'll work in between now and then to uh, get you some answers as well. Um, go ahead, Anne. Anne. Yeah, just back on the, the liability, gunmaker liability issue again, um, at the risk of flogging a dead horse. I'm just okay. wondering if you can explain what changed between when, as a candidate, uh, Biden said that he, he would send legislation himself on day one to now, day 70, whatever it is, when your position is that Congress should do this on its own, is that right? What, what, what I don't think we're this? saying on its own, on their own. Uh, just like there is legislation on banning assault weapons that the president supports, there's wet legislation on uh, increasing, expanding universal background checks, which he supports. There's also been legislation, uh, many cycles uh, of Congress on uh, gun liability, holding uh, gun uh, manufacturers to the same liability standards as other industries. So all I'm conveying is he would certainly advocate that for that as he did today. Uh, there is an opportunity to reintroduce legislation. We're certainly hopeful that members do that, and he would advocate for it uh, and, and, and certainly use the power of the presidency to move it forward. But has he ruled out sending, drafting something himself, or you guys, yourselves? Well, I think uh, it's not necessary. It's not perhaps necessary, given there have been a range of bills proposed uh, that would address exactly this issue, and a range of leaders in Congress who have been advocates for putting in place common sense gun safety measures. I wouldn't rule anything out. All I'm conveying is that there has been a range of bills put forward in the past that he would support that would address exactly this issue. 
Um, go. Oh, go ahead, Anne. Go ahead. Actually, something okay. Else. Go ahead. Um, so there's a spike uh, in, in coronavirus cases in Japan, and, and vaccines are in very short supply. With the prime minister coming next week, and the Tokyo Olympics uh, as, as a huge priority for the Japanese. Is it still the U.S. position that American athletes should attend those games? And are you persuaded, is the president persuaded, that they will be safe? Our position hasn't changed. Obviously, we work in close coordination with the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, on assessing and with our health and medical uh, advisors in the U.S. government on assessing, but our position has not changed in their attendance at the games. One more very quickly. Uh, is there any update on uh, announcements for ambassadors? We're now past March, which you had said was, was sort of when many other administrations had, had done so, and you haven't put any, forward, any, any big ones forward yet. Uh, I don't have an exact update other than to convey that I would uh, I would expect that uh, nominees for career career nominees will probably be in the first um, slate of nominees uh, for ambassadors as you're as you're planning. Um, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a couple questions on the president's gun safety executive orders. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, does the administration have data on how many crimes have been committed with these ghost guns that your team could share? I'm sure we can get you some data. Sure, and I, I bet you a range of the uh, the experts who are joining us here today have a bunch of data uh, and uh, that they could share with you as well, even maybe on their websites. Very good. All right, then following up, the, the president said a moment ago, quote, you go to a gun show, you can buy whatever you want, no background check. Is there a special exemption in federal law that he was referring to, or just do FLA dealers not have to do background checks when they're at a gun show? Are, are you asking me if he was referring? No, it's okay. Yeah. Were you asking me if he was referring to like a specific circumstance? Or I'm sorry, to tell me a little bit more about yeah. your question. I mean, is it the president's belief that you do not have to undergo a background check when you are at a gun show? No, it's not his belief. He believes that gun that background check should be universal. Right, but he says no background check. Well, we know what his position is, right? So let me reiterate that, which is that uh, gut background checks are something that should be universal. They're supported by more than 80% of the public. He's supported legislation, advocated for that, um, and uh, advocated against loopholes as well. So that's his position, and I appreciate you asking for the clarification. Go ahead. One here. Um, I know the DOJ is working on this regulation, sure. and then we're gonna have to wait. Um, but with regards to the stabilizing braces, uh, what's the message to people who, you know, earlier on, uh, before this was an issue, law-abiding folks who, who bought these um, and who weren't criminals? According to the Congressional Research Service, there's something like 40 million currently in circulation. What should the law-abiding American do as they await that regulation? I mean, should they expect buybacks or should they be prepared to turn those in or is this a confiscation situation? I don't think that's what we're suggesting. There's obviously going to be some time to put in place this regulation, as you referred to, and uh, take a close look at the most effective way to do that. And what the effort here uh, is that's underway is to put in place measures that make the country safer and make communities safer. And obviously there are uh, impacts. Uh, we, we, every step that he announced today, we believe would do exactly that. Quick circle back from oh. last week in terms of uh, the scheduling of, of fentanyl as Schedule One. I know yeah. it's a difficult issue with a lot of moving parts, but um, given that that scheduling is set to expire in May, is the administration taking a closer look at um, the scheduling of fentanyl analogs? Well, I know you asked about this, and I'm sorry we failed to get you a good answer on it. We will venture to do that um, before May 1st is the deadline. Is that not your deadline, but yeah. the timeline? The timeline uh, the, of the of the expiration. I Is that correct? It's the, the first week of May. Okay, we will check that, and we will venture to do a better job getting back with you on that. Go ahead. Can I ask today's print pool, or I'm going to ask an inquiry for myself. One of my colleagues can't be here because of COVID restrictions, and then I have a wild card question. Okay, I like the setup. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, let's start with me. Um, okay. Despite warnings, anti-trend and a legal form of sex discrimination, a number of states have enacted into law uh, measures against transgender youth, including a measure the Arkansas legislature uh, enacted into law this week by uh, overriding a veto mm -hmm. of the governor. Uh, will the president reach out to the attorney general for legal action against these measures? Uh I don't know that I can stand here. I can't stand here and predict legal action. Obviously, that would be a decision made by the Justice Department and the Attorney General. 
What I can say is that the president's view is that uh, all persons should receive equal treatment under law, no matter their gender identity or sexual orientation. That's fundamental to how he uh, will make laws, advocate for laws, I should say, how he will communicate about his views on the rights of transgender individuals in the country, and certainly um, you know, what his view is as it relates to any actions by the government. But in terms of legal action, I would point you to the Attorney General and the Justice Department. Well, I understand that, but why not? Uh, why can, uh, why uh, shouldn't the president be able to communicate with the attorney general on, on the legal? He certainly can, Ken. I don't have anything to predict for you on that at this point in time. And the question from my colleague is next. Um, how involved is former President Obama and First Lady Obama in the Biden-Harris administration? Is President Biden seeking to bring back the often bipartisan portrait unveiling events at the White House? I'm certain we will have bipartisan portrait unveiling events at the appropriate time when COVID allows. Um, I don't know when that will be, but uh, that certainly would be something I know the president would support. Uh, in terms of his engagement with President Obama, they are, fr they are not just former colleagues, I guess you call them as president and vice president, but they are also uh, remain close friends, uh, and they talk regularly about a range of issues, from policy issues to bouncing ideas off of each other to um, to their families. Uh, so they are in close touch, but we just don't read out those specific calls. We keep them private. And now my wild card question. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on in the South Lawn. What's up with that? Oh, I like that. Uh, it's a, I, I'm happy to get you kind of a more official response on this, but it is a kind of regular maintenance. I expect it to be good. I think we expect it to be going on for eight to ten weeks, um, but uh, we can get you a more official. A new construction going on there, something that's really, I suppose, to like regular uh, happenings. I mean, is, is, is this something that is consistently going on, or is this like a new construction for a new event or a new thing on the, on the South Lawn? No. It, it's not, but but I can get you a more official uh, 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 statement from our team that is overseeing the up, updates and the maintenance. Okay. Go ahead in the back. Thank you, Jen. Three questions on gun violence. Does President Biden have a deadline for Congress to act? And if they don't meet that deadline, is he prepared with more executive action? First, the president's not going to wait. Uh, for Congress to act to take additional executive actions. This is the beginning. He will continue to have his team review both from a policy uh, and a legal standpoint exec additional executive actions that are possible to take. Um, I would just remind everyone that he also led the effort to put in place nearly two dozen executive actions under the Obama-Biden Obama administration, and he fully recognizes that the only way to put in place permanent long-term measures to keep our children, our communities, and our, uh, our and families across the country safe is by passing legislation. So he will also, is also committed to that. But he's not going to wait. He can move on both levers at the same time. And how soon does the president expect or hope to see change due to the executive action, action today? Change in, in what way? So does he expect to see some of his policies in place? Well, there, there are certain uh, periods of time of reviews for, for different components of this. Obviously, things like the guidance on red flag laws is something that states could use as soon as that's prepared and distributed to move forward on putting in place red flag laws. There are certain components of this that require 30 days, 60 days, et cetera. So I would say it just depends on the component of, his, uh, of uh, what he proposed this morning. Final question for you. President Biden mentioned Fred Gutenberg by name in the Rose Garden mm -hmm. today. What role did Fred and other gun safety advocates play in crafting uh, this executive action? Well, first I would say that uh, people like uh, Fred Gutenberg and Shannon Watts and Gabby Giffords, I mean, these are people who are absolute heroes on getting gun safety measures in place. They have led the effort when there was no appetite in Washington and none at the federal level to move forward on um, putting in place laws around the country. And the president recognizes that. And he has a huge respect and value for the role that they've played. That's why they were here today. Uh, he's had conversations. Our team has had conversations uh, at a range of levels with a number of these uh, gun safety leaders through the course of the president's presidency. And they have ideas, they have proposals, and certainly that's taken into account as we were considered considering policy options to put forward today. Go ahead, oh, go ahead. The <laughs> German Chancellor Merkel um, spoke with Vladimir Putin today and demanded the withdrawal of the Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. What is the US position and has there been any contacts between the US and Russia in the recent days about this issue? 
Uh, I don't have any additional uh, contact to read out aside from I think the last high level contact was at the defense uh, minister level that took place at the end of last week. But since you gave me the opportunity, let me just convey that the United States is increasingly concerned by recent escalating Russian aggressions in eastern Ukraine, including uh, Russian troop movements on Ukraine's border. Russia now has more troops on the border with Ukraine than at any time since 2014. Five Ukrainian soldiers have been killed this week alone. Uh, these are all deeply concerning signs. Uh, we are, of course, um, the President spoke with President Zelensky, as you know, uh, last week. Um, in addition to reassurances to Ukrainian officials, uh, the United States, uh, we are also discussing our concerns about the increase in tensions uh, in ceasefire violations and regional tensions with NATO allies. So that's another part of the conversations that is ongoing. But I don't have any engagements with the Russians to read out. After issuing a multitude of sanctions in the last years, and even after calling Vladimir Putin a killer, as the president did, in general, what do you think, how is the influence, does the U.S. and does the general, in, in, in the West in general, have any influence on Vladimir Putin? Do we have any influence on Vladimir Putin? Look, I think that is uh, perhaps in some ways suggesting that just because someone does bad behavior, we shouldn't hold them accountable unless we know it's going to immediately change their behavior. And that's just not how we see foreign policy um, or how we see our engagement in the world. Um, and look, I think uh, our focus is on there's an, still an ongoing review, weeks, not months, weeks, not months, and that, uh, that we are assessing uh, as it relates to the troubling actions of Russia and this Russian government, uh, where there will be consequences, as the president has conveyed, seen and unseen. And we hope to have more on that soon. Uh, go ahead. Just to follow up on your answer there regarding former President Obama, because you said they are in touch fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. Can you more clearly define fairly regularly? No, that would be violating their friendship. Okay. Is it fair to say he is? The privacy of their friendship, I should say. Is he fairly regularly in touch with any other former president? I would say he is the president he's most frequent, former president he's most frequently in touch with. We're talking a few times a week, a few times a month. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to give it a more define, I'm not going to define it more other than to say that um, they engage not just about freak important moments in our country, but also about their own families. They have a connection on a personal level. Um, so they discuss a range of issues when they connect. Yeah. Go ahead, Caitlin. Does the president agree with Senator Manchin that budget reconciliation should not replace regular order in the Senate? Well, first, for those of you who read the op-ed today or didn't read the op-ed, either way, um, <laughs> did you all read it? Oh, sur surprised to hear, surprised to hear. Um, you know, I will say there's a couple of principles the president has um, as it relates to engagement with Congress and how Democrats and Republicans should work together. Uh, the time has come to end these political games and to usher a new era of bipartisanship where we can find common ground on the major policy debates for, for facing our nation. He also believes the issues facing our democracy today are not insurmountable if we choose to tackle them together. And he definitely believes that Republicans have a responsibility to stop saying no and participate in finding real compromise with Democrats. Does he agree with this line? Well, let me just say, those are all lines in, in Senator Manchin's uh, op opinion piece. Uh, look, the president believes that there is a path forward uh, to get in for this uh, American Jobs Plan passed uh, with bipartisan support. That's why he's going to invite Democrats and Republicans here. That's why he's going to hear from them on their ideas that they've already put forward. Uh, we're going to leave it to leaders in Congress to determine the mechanisms for moving things forward, but we think there should be every opportunity to do this on a bipartisan basis. Hey, Tim, just one, one more thing. Can, yeah. you, can you rule out those Russian sanctions coming this week? Coming this week? Uh, yes. How about next week? I'm not going to rule out further. I'm just trying to give you some sleep tomorrow. We already have the, the, um, the, the, guidance, the budget guidance coming tomorrow. We can't overload you on a Friday. About infrastructure, I know that you mentioned Secretary Buttigieg would be here tomorrow. Unfortunately, due to social distancing, I will not be. So, when it comes, we to will the take your questions with one of your colleagues. Yeah, we will email the print pooler. But okay. with regards to the 20,000 miles of highways, roads, and main streets that yep. are in the president's infrastructure plan, it also says it will fix the 10 most economically significant bridges in the country, mm -hmm. and it specifically says it will repair the worst 10,000 smaller bridges. 
So the White House, to this point, has not released any sort of a list of these. So why isn't there a list that you can share with us? And presumably there is some sort of a list, because otherwise, where did you get the 20,000 and 10,000 numbers from? In terms of roads and railways that need to be repaired? Yes. Where did those numbers come from? We can certainly get you a citation. What I did the other day, but I'm happy to reiterate, is explain that we expect that the package and the funding will come through a combination of grants formula grants and competitive grants, right? And formula grants are allocated to states based on certain criteria, like the number of miles of an interstate highway or a population in a given urban area. Uh, most of our existing transportation funding flows through formula grants. So with past uh, infrastructure funding bills that have gone through Congress uh, in, the, in the last several decades. This gives states a lot of flexibility in covering how they repair roads, how they repair um, rail, you know, things that need to be repaired in their state. The other part, the type of funding is competitive grants, which those 10 bridges you talked about, uh, they would be through competitive grants. So these direct funding to certain policy goals, like the Tiger Grant Program that was a part of the Recovery Act. So there's just different, we expect that to be how it's structured, that will all be discussed and finalized uh, through our conversations with members of Congress, um, with leaders in Congress, about what the combination of those uh, funding components should be. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. One uh, final thing question. Yeah. Uh, the Vice President talked a little bit about his, uh, so the President talked about his role as Vice President leading the Obama Administration's National Led Guns. We, we've seen a lot of conversations about gun control legislation in that Rose Garden before. Yep. Why does the President think that this time will be different? than any other time, really when he was in, in the vice presidency for this legislation, and how much, and, you know, is he committing that it will be different, I should say? He is committing that it will be different, and if the president uh, was just defeated, uh, every time he was defeated on an objective or a goal, he wouldn't be president. So here he is. He remains an advocate throughout his life to putting in place gun safety measures, uh, and it's something that he has been committed to, not just through words, but through action, and he believes it's something that, as president, uh, he can help move forward uh, and put in place more action. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.